When you were little, did you and your siblings ever communicate in a secret language around your parents? It didn't really matter what you were talking about, as long as your parents didn't know what it was. That was the fun part, right? It may have seemed like a fun game when you were younger, but for as long as humans have been around, we've created ways to keep messages secret from others. In this lesson, we'll cover how this plays out through symmetric encryption, asymmetric encryption, and hashing. We'll also go over how to describe the most common algorithms in cryptography and learn how to choose the most appropriate cryptographic method in any given scenario. But before we dive into the nitty-gritty details of cryptography, the various types that exist in our applications, let's go over some terminology and general principles that will help you understand the details later. The topic of cryptography, or hiding messages from potential enemies, has been around for thousands of years. It's evolved tremendously with the advent of modern technology, computers, and telecommunications. Encryption is the act of taking a message called plain text and applying an operation to it called a cipher so that you receive a garbled, unreadable message as the output called ciphertext. The reverse process, taking the garbled output and transforming it back into the readable plain text, is called decryption. For example, let's look at a simple cipher where we substitute E for O and O for Y. We'll take the plain text, hello world, and feed it into our basic cipher. What do you think the resulting ciphertext will be? Hopefully, you've got Holly World. It's pretty easy to decipher the ciphertext, since this is a very basic example. There are much more complex and secure ciphers or algorithms that we'll cover later in this section. A cipher is actually made up of two components, the encryption algorithm and the key. The encryption algorithm is the underlying logic or process that's used to convert the plaintext into ciphertext. These algorithms are usually very complex mathematical operations, but there are also some very basic algorithms that we can take a closer look at that don't necessarily require a PhD in math to understand. The other crucial component of a cipher is the key, which introduces something unique into your cipher. Without the key, anyone using the same algorithm would be able to decode your message, and you wouldn't actually have any secrecy. So to recap, first, you pick an encryption algorithm you'd like to use to encode your message. Then, choose a key. Now you have a cipher which you can run your plain text message through and get an encrypted cipher text out, ready to be sent out into the world, safe and secure from prying eyes. Doesn't this make you feel like an international person of mystery? Just wait. Given that the underlying purpose of cryptography is to protect your secrets from being read by unauthorized parties, it would make sense that at least some of the components of a cipher would need to be kept secret too, right? You could make the argument that by keeping the algorithm secret, your messages are secured from snooping third parties, and technically, you wouldn't be wrong. This general concept is referred to as security through obscurity, which basically means if no one knows what algorithm we're using or general security practice, then we're safe from attackers. Think of hiding your house key under your doormat. As long as the burglar doesn't know that you hide a spare key under the mat, you're safe. But once that information is discovered, all security goes out the window, along with your valuables. So clearly, security through obscurity isn't something that you should rely on for securing communication or systems, or for your house for that matter. This overall concept of cryptography is referred to as Kirchhoff's principle. This principle states that a crypto system, or a collection of algorithms for key generation and encryption and decryption operations that comprise a cryptographic service, should remain secure, even if everything about the system is known, except for the key. What this means is that even if your enemy knows the exact encryption algorithm you use to secure your data, they're still unable to recover the plain text from an intercepted ciphertext. You may also hear this principle referred to as Shannon's maxim, or the enemy knows the system. The implications are the same. The system should remain secure, even if your adversary knows exactly what kind of encryption systems you're employing, as long as your keys remain secure. We already defined encryption but the overarching discipline that covers the practice of coding and hiding messages from third parties is called cryptography. The study of this practice is referred to as cryptology. The opposite of this, looking for hidden messages or trying to decipher coded messages, is referred to as cryptanalysis. These two fields have co-evolved throughout history, with new ciphers and crypto systems being developed as previous ones were broken or found to be vulnerable. One of the earliest recorded descriptions of cryptanalysis is from a 9th century Arabian mathematician who described a method for frequency analysis 
to break coded messages. Frequency analysis is the practice of studying the frequency with which letters appear in ciphertext. The premise behind this type of analysis is that in written languages, certain letters appear more frequently than others, and some letters are more commonly grouped together than others. For example, the most commonly used letters in the English language are E, T, A, and O. The most commonly seen pairs of these letters are TH, ER, ON, and AN. Some ciphers, especially classical transposition and substitution ciphers, preserve the relative frequency of letters in the plaintext, and so are potentially vulnerable to this type of analysis. During World War I and World War II, cryptography and cryptanalysis played an increasingly important role. There was a shift away from linguistics and frequency analysis and a move towards more mathematical-based analysis. This was due to more complex and sophisticated ciphers being developed. A major turning point in the field of cryptanalysis was during World War II when the U.S. allies began to incorporate sophisticated mathematics to aid in breaking Axis encryption schemes. This also saw the first use of automation technology applied to cryptanalysis in England at Bletchley Park. The first programmable digital computer, named Colossus, was developed to aid in this effort. While early computers were applied to breaking cryptography, this opened the door for a huge leap forward in the development of even more sophisticated and complex cryptosystems. Steganography is a related practice, but distinctly different from cryptography. It's the practice of hiding information from observers, but not encoding it. Think of writing a message using invisible ink. The message is in plain text, and no decoding is necessary to read the text, but the text is hidden from sight. The ink is invisible and must be made visible using a mechanism known to the recipient. Modern steganographic techniques include embedding messages and even files into other files, like images or videos. To a casual observer, they would just see a picture of a cute puppy. But if you feed that image into steganography software, it would extract a message hidden within the image file. What's not so secret is how fun it is to learn about all this spy stuff, don't you think? Stick around, because next we'll talk about specific cryptographic methods and systems. So far, we've been talking pretty generally about cryptographic systems and focusing primarily on encryption concepts, but not decryption. It makes sense that if you're sending a protected message to someone, you'd want your recipient to be able to decode the message and read it, and maybe even reply with a coded message of their own. So let's check out the first broad category of encryption algorithms and dive into more details about how it works, along with some pros and cons. When we covered Kirchhoff's principle earlier, do you remember which component of the cipher is crucial to keep secret? That's right, the key must be kept private to ensure that an eavesdropper wouldn't be able to decode encrypted messages. In this scenario, we're making the assumption that the algorithm in use is what's referred to as symmetric key algorithm. These types of encryption algorithms are called symmetric because they use the same key to encrypt and decrypt messages. Let's take a simple example of a symmetric key encryption algorithm to walk through the overall process of encrypting and decrypting a message. A substitution cipher is an encryption mechanism that replaces parts of your plain text with ciphertext. Remember our hello world example from earlier? That's an example of substitution cipher, since we're substituting some characters with different ones. In this case, the key would be the mapping of characters between plain text and ciphertext. Without knowing what letters get replaced with, you wouldn't be able to easily decode the ciphertext and recover the plaintext. If you have the key or the substitution table, then you can easily reverse the process and decrypt the coded message by just performing the reverse operation. A well-known example of a substitution cipher is the Caesar cipher, which is a substitution alphabet. In this case, you're replacing characters in the alphabet with others, usually by shifting or rotating the alphabet a set of numbers or characters. The number of the offset is the key Another popular example of this is referred to as ROT13, or ROT13, where the alphabet is rotated 13 places. But really, ROT13 is a Caesar cipher that uses a key of 13. Let's go back to our Hello World example and walk through encoding it using our ROT13 cipher. Our cipher text winds up being URYYBJBEYQ. To reverse this process and go back to the plain text, we just perform the reverse operation by looking up the characters in the output side of the mapping table. You might notice something about the ROT13 mapping table or the fact 
that we're offsetting the alphabet by 13 characters. 13 is exactly half of the alphabet. This results in the ROT13 cipher being an inverse of itself. What this means is that you can recover the plain text from ciphertext by performing the ROT13 operation on the ciphertext. If we were to choose a different key, let's say 8, can we do the same thing? Let's check. Here's the mapping table for an offset of 8, which gives us the ciphertext of OLSSVDVYSK. If we run this through the cipher once more, we get the following output, VSZZCKCFZR. That doesn't work to reverse the encryption process, does it? There are two more categories that symmetric key ciphers can be placed into. They're either block ciphers or they're stream ciphers. This relates to how the ciphers operate on the plain text to be encrypted. A stream cipher, as the name implies, takes a stream of input and encrypts the stream one character or one digit at a time outputting one encrypted character or digit at a time. So there's a one-to-one -one relationship between data in and encrypted data out. The other category of symmetric ciphers is block ciphers. The cipher takes data in, places it into a bucket or block of data that's a fixed size, then encodes that entire block as one unit. If the data to be encrypted isn't big enough to fill the block, the extra space will be padded to ensure the plain text fits into the blocks evenly. Now, generally speaking, stream ciphers are faster and less complex to implement, but they can be less secure than block ciphers if the key generation and handling isn't done properly. If the same key is used to encrypt data two or more times, it's possible to break the cipher and to recover the plaintext. To avoid key reuse, initialization vector, or IV, is used. That's a bit of random data that's integrated into the encryption key, and the resulting combined key is then used to encrypt the data. The idea behind this is if you have one shared master key, then generate a one-time encryption key. That encryption key is used only once by generating a new key using the master one and the IV. In order for the encrypted message to be decoded, the IV must be sent in plain text along with the encrypted message. A good example of this can be seen when inspecting the 802.11 frame of a WEP encrypted wireless packet. The IV is included in plain text right before the encrypted data payload. In the last section, we cover the basics of what exactly symmetric encryption algorithms are and gave a basic example of the Caesar cipher, a type of substitution cipher. We couldn't possibly protect anything of value using this cipher, though, right? There must be more complex and secure symmetric algorithms, right? Of course there are. One of the earliest encryption standards is DES, which stands for Data Encryption Standard. DES was designed in the 1970s by IBM, with some input from the US National Security Agency. DES was adopted as an official FIPS, Federal Information Processing Standard, for the US. This means that DES was adopted as a federal standard for encrypting and securing government data. DES is a symmetric block cipher that uses 64-bit key sizes and operates on blocks 64 bits in size. Though the key size is technically 64 bits, 8 bits are used only for parity checking, a simple form of error checking. This means that real-world key length for DES is only 56 bits. A quick note about encryption key sizes, since we haven't covered that yet. In symmetric encryption algorithms, the same key is used to encrypt as to decrypt everything else being the same. The key is the unique piece that protects your data, and the symmetric key must be kept secret to ensure the confidentiality of the data being protected. The key size, defined in bits, is the total number of bits, or data, that comprises the encryption key. So, you can think of the key size as the upper limit for the total possible keys for a given encryption algorithm. Key length is super important in cryptography since it essentially defines the maximum potential strength of the system. Imagine an ideal symmetric encryption algorithm where there are no flaws or weaknesses in the algorithm itself. In this scenario, the only possible way for an adversary to break your encryption would be to attack the key instead of the algorithm. One attack method is to just guess the key and see if the message decodes correctly. This is referred to as a brute force attack. Longer key lengths protect against this type of attack. Let's take the DES key as an example. 64 bits long minus the 8 parity bits gives us a key length of 56 bits. 
This means that there are a maximum of 2 to the 56 power, or 72 quadrillion possible keys. That seems like a ton of keys, and back in the 1970s, it was. But as technology advanced, and computers got faster and more efficient, 64-bit keys quickly proved to be too small. What were once only theoretical attacks on the key size became reality in 1998, when the EFF, Electronic Frontier Foundation, decrypted a DES encrypted message in only 56 hours. Because of the inherent weakness of the small key size of DES, replacement algorithms were designed and proposed. A number of new ones appeared in the 1980s and 1990s. Many kept the 64-bit block size, but used a larger key size, allowing for easier replacement of DES. In 1997, the NIST, National Institute of Standards and Technology, wanted to replace DES with a new algorithm, and in 2001, adopted AES, Advanced Encryption Standard, after an international competition. AES is also the first and only public cipher that's approved for use with top secret information by the United States National Security Agency. AES is also a symmetric block cipher, similar to DES in which it replaced. But AES uses 128-bit blocks, twice the size of DES blocks, and supports key lengths of 128-bit, 192-bit, or 256-bit. Because of the large key size, brute force attacks on AES are only theoretical right now, because the computing power required, or time required using modern technology, exceeds anything feasible today. I want to call out that these algorithms are the overall designs of the ciphers themselves. These designs then must be implemented in either software or hardware before the encryption functions can be applied and put to use. An important thing to keep in mind when considering various encryption algorithms is speed and ease of implementation. Ideally, an algorithm shouldn't be overly difficult to implement because complicated implementation can lead to errors and potential loss of security due to bugs introduced in implementation. Speed is important because sometimes data will be encrypted by running the data through the cipher multiple times. These types of cryptographic operations wind up being performed very often by devices, so the faster they can be accomplished with the minimal impact to the system, the better. This is why some platforms implement these cryptographic algorithms in hardware to accelerate the processes and remove some of the burden from the CPU. For example, modern CPUs from Intel or AMD have AES instructions built into the CPUs themselves. This allows for far greater computational speed and efficiency when working on cryptographic workloads. Let's talk briefly about what was once a wildly used and popular algorithm, but has since been proven to be weak and is discouraged from use. RC4, or Rivis Cipher 4, is a symmetric stream cipher that gained widespread adoption because of its simplicity and speed. RC4 supports key sizes from 40 bits to 2048 bits, so the weaknesses of RC4 aren't due to brute force attacks. But the cipher itself has inherent weaknesses and vulnerabilities that aren't only theoretically possible. There are lots of examples showing RC4 being broken. A recent example of RC4 being broken is the RC4 No More attack. This attack was able to recover an authentication cookie from a TLS encrypted connection in just 52 hours. As this is an attack on the RC4 cipher itself, any protocol that uses this cipher is potentially vulnerable to the attack. Even so, RC4 was used in a bunch of popular encryption protocols, like WEP for wireless encryption and WPA, the successor to WEP. It was also supported in SSL and TLS until 2015, when RC4 was dropped in all versions of TLS because of inherent weaknesses. For this reason, most major web browsers have dropped support for RC4 entirely, along with all versions of SSL and use TLS instead. The preferred secure configuration is TLS 1.2 with AES GCM, a specific mode of operation for the AES block cipher that essentially turns it into a stream cipher. GCM, or Galois counter mode, works by taking randomized seed value, incrementing this, and encrypting the value, creating sequentially numbered blocks of ciphertext. The ciphertexts are then incorporated into the plain text to be encrypted. GCM is super popular due to its security, being based on AES encryption, along with its performance and the fact that it can be run in parallel with great efficiency. You can read more about the RC4 No More attack in the next reading. 
So now that we have covered symmetric encryption and some examples of symmetric encryption algorithms, what are the benefits or disadvantages of using symmetric encryption? Because of the symmetric nature of the encryption and decryption process, it's relatively easy to implement and maintain. That's one shared secret that you have to maintain and keep secure. Think of your Wi-Fi password at home. There's one shared secret, your Wi-Fi password, that allows all devices to connect to it. Can you imagine having a specific Wi-Fi password for each device of yours? That would be a nightmare and super hard to keep track of. Symmetric algorithms are also very fast and efficient at encrypting and decrypting large batches of data. So what are the downsides of using symmetric encryption? While having one shared secret that both encrypts and decrypts seems convenient up front, this can actually introduce some complications. What happens if your secret is compromised? Imagine that your Wi-Fi password was stolen, and now you have to change it. Now you have to update your Wi-Fi password on all your devices and any devices your friends or family might bring over. What do you have to do when a friend or family member comes to visit and they want to get on your Wi-Fi? You need to provide them with your Wi-Fi password or the shared secret that protects your Wi-Fi network. This usually isn't an issue since you hopefully know the person and you trust them. And it's usually only one or two people at a time. But what if you had a party at your place with 50 strangers? Uh, side note, why are you having a party at your home with 50 strangers? Uh, anyhow, how could you provide the Wi-Fi password only to the people you trust without strangers overhearing? Things could get really awkward really fast. In the next lesson, we'll explore other ways besides symmetric key algorithms to protect data and information. Asymmetric, or public key ciphers. Remember why symmetric ciphers are referred to as symmetric? It's because the same key is used to encrypt as to decrypt. This is in contrast to asymmetric encryption systems because, as the name implies, different keys are used to encrypt and decrypt. So how exactly does that work? Well, let's imagine here that there are two people who would like to communicate securely. We'll call them Suzanne and Daryl. Since they're using asymmetric encryption in this example, the first thing they each must do is generate a private key. Then, using this private key, a public key is derived. The strength of the asymmetric encryption system comes from the computational difficulty of figuring out the corresponding private key given a public key. Once Suzanne and Daryl have generated private and public key pairs, they exchange public keys. You might have guessed from the names that the public key is public and can be shared with anyone while the private key must be kept secret. Once Suzanne and Daryl have exchanged public keys, they're ready to begin exchanging secure messages. When Suzanne wants to send Daryl an encrypted message, she uses Daryl's public key to encrypt the message and then send the ciphertext. Daryl can then use his private key to decrypt the message and read it. Because of the relationship between private and public keys, only Daryl's private key can decrypt messages encrypted using Daryl's public key. The same is true of Suzanne's key pairs. So when Daryl is ready to reply to Suzanne's message, he'll use Suzanne's public key to encode his message, and Suzanne will use her private key to decrypt the message. Can you see why it's called asymmetric or public key cryptography? We just described encryption and decryption operations using an asymmetric crypto system, but there's one other very useful function the system can perform, public key signatures. Let's go back to our friends Suzanne and Daryl. Let's say Suzanne wants to send a message to Daryl and she wants to make sure that Daryl knows the message came from her and no one else, and that the message was not modified or tampered with. She could do this by composing the message and combining it with her private key to generate a digital signature. She then sends this message along with the associated digital signature to Daryl. We're assuming Suzanne and Daryl have already exchanged public keys previously in this scenario. Daryl can now verify the message's origin and authenticity by combining the message the digital signature, and Suzanne's public key. If the message was actually signed using Suzanne's private key and not someone else's, and the message wasn't modified at all, then the digital signature should validate. If the message was modified, even by one white space character, the validation will fail, and Daryl shouldn't trust the message. This is an important component of the asymmetric crypto system. Without message verification, Anyone could use Daryl's public key and send him an encrypted message claiming to be from Suzanne. The three concepts that an asymmetric crypto system grants us are confidentiality, authenticity, and non-repudiation. Confidentiality is granted through the encryption-decryption mechanism, since our encrypted data is kept confidential and secret from unauthorized third parties. 
authenticity is granted by the digital signature mechanism, as the message can be authenticated or verified that it wasn't tampered with. Non-repudiation means that the author of the message isn't able to dispute the origin of the message. In other words, this allows us to ensure that the message came from the person claiming to be the author. Can you see the benefit of using an asymmetric encryption algorithm versus a symmetric one? Asymmetric encryption allows secure communication over an untrusted channel. But with symmetric encryption, we need some way to securely communicate the shared secret or key with the other party. If that's the case, it seems like asymmetric encryption is better, right? Well, sort of. While asymmetric encryption works really well in untrusted environments, it's also computationally more expensive and complex. On the other hand, symmetric encryption algorithms are faster and more efficient at encrypting large amounts of data. In fact, what many secure communication schemes do is take advantage of the relative benefits of both encryption types by using both for different purposes. An asymmetric encryption algorithm is chosen as a key exchange mechanism or cipher. What this means is that the symmetric encryption key or shared secret is transmitted securely to the other party using asymmetric encryption to keep the shared secret secure in transit. Once the shared secret is received, data can be sent quickly and efficiently and securely using an asymmetric encryption cipher. Clever, huh? One last topic to mention is somewhat related to asymmetric encryption, and that's MAX, or Message Authentication Codes, not to be confused with Media Access Control or MAC addresses. A MAC is a bit of information that allows authentication of a received message, ensuring that the message came from the alleged sender and not a third party masquerading as them. It also ensures that the message wasn't modified in some way in order to provide data integrity. This sounds super similar to digital signatures using public key cryptography, doesn't it? While very similar, it differs slightly since the secret key that's used to generate the MAC is the same one that's used to verify it. In this sense, it's similar to symmetric encryption system, and the secret key must be agreed upon by all communicating parties beforehand, or shared in some secure way. This describes one popular and secure type of MAC called HMAC, or a keyed hash message authentication code. HMAC uses a cryptographic hash function along with a secret key to generate a MAC. Any cryptographic hash functions can be used, like SHA-1 or MD5, and the strength or security of the MAC is dependent upon the underlying security of the cryptographic hash function used. The MAC is sent alongside the message that's being checked. The MAC is verified by the receiver by performing the same operation on the received message, then comparing the computed MAC with the one received with the message. If the MACs are the same, then the message is authenticated. There are also MACs based on symmetric encryption ciphers, either block or stream, like DES or AES, which are called CMACs, or cipher-based message authentication codes. The process is similar to HMAC, but instead of using a hashing function to produce a digest, a symmetric cipher with a shared key is used to encrypt the message, and the resulting output is used as the MAC. A specific and popular example of a CMAC, though slightly different, is CBC MAC, or Cipher Block Chaining Message Authentication Codes. CBC MAC is a mechanism for building MACs using block ciphers. This works by taking a message and encrypting it using a block cipher operating in CBC mode. CBC mode is an operating mode for block ciphers that incorporates the previously encrypted block ciphertext into the next block's plaintext. So, it builds a chain of encrypted blocks that require the full, unmodified chain to decrypt. This chain of interdependently encrypted blocks means that any modification to the plaintext will result in a different final output at the end of the chain, ensuring message integrity. So, one of the first practical asymmetric cryptography systems to be developed is RSA, named for the initials of the three co-inventors, Ron Rivest, Adi Shamir, and Leonard Aldeman. This crypto system was patented in 1983 and was released to the public domain by RSA Security in the year 2000. The RSA system specifies mechanisms for generation and distribution of keys, along with encryption and decryption operation using these keys. We won't go into the details of the math involved, since it's pretty high-level stuff and beyond the scope of this class. But it's important to know that the key generation process depends on choosing two unique, 
random, and usually very large prime numbers. DSA, or Digital Signature Algorithm, is another example of an asymmetric encryption system, though it's used for signing and verifying data. It was patented in 1991 and is part of the US government's Federal Information Processing Standard. Similar to RSA, the specification covers the key generation process along with the signing and verifying data using the key pairs. It's important to call out that the security of this system is dependent on choosing a random seed value that's incorporated into the signing process. If this value is leaked, or if it can be inferred if the prime number isn't truly random, then it's possible for an attacker to recover the private key. This actually happened in 2010 to Sony with their PlayStation 3 game console. It turns out they weren't ensuring this randomized value was changed for every signature. This resulted in a hacker group called Fail Overflow being able to recover the private key that Sony used to sign software for their platform. This allowed modders to write and sign custom software that was allowed to run on the otherwise very locked down console platform. This resulted in game piracy becoming a problem for Sony, as this facilitated the illicit copying and distribution of games, which caused significant losses in sales. I've included links to more about this in the next reading, in case you want to dive deeper. Earlier, we talked about how asymmetric systems are commonly used as key exchange mechanisms to establish a shared secret that will be used with a symmetric cipher. Another popular key exchange algorithm is DH, or Diffie-Hellman, named for the co-inventors. Let's walk through how the DH key exchange algorithm works. Let's assume we have two people who'd like to communicate over an unsecured channel, and let's call them Suzanne and Daryl. I've grown pretty fond of these two. First, Suzanne and Daryl agree on a starting number that would be random and will be a very large integer. This number should be different for every session and doesn't need to be secret. Next, each person chooses another randomized large number, but this one is kept secret. Then, they combine their shared number with their respective secret number and send the resulting mix to each other. Next, each person combines their secret number with the combined value they received from the previous step. The result is a new value that's the same on both sides without disclosing enough information to any potential eavesdroppers to figure out the shared secret. This algorithm was designed solely for key exchange, though there have been efforts to adapt it for encryption purposes. It's even been used as part of a PKI system, or Public Key Infrastructure System. We'll dive more into PKI systems later in this course. Elliptic Curve Cryptography, or ECC, is a public key encryption system that uses the algebraic structure of elliptic curves over finite fields to generate secure keys. Uh, what does that even mean? Well, traditional public key systems make use of factoring large prime numbers, whereas ECC makes use of elliptic curves. An elliptic curve is composed of a set of coordinates that fit an equation, similar to something like y to the second equals x to the third plus ax plus b. Elliptic curves have a couple interesting and unique properties. One is horizontal symmetry, which means that at any point in the curve can be mirrored along the x-axis and still make up the same curve. On top of this, any non-vertical line will intersect the curve in three places at most. It's this last property that allows elliptic curves to be used in encryption. The benefit of elliptic curve-based encryption systems is that they're able to achieve security similar to traditional public key systems with smaller key sizes. So, for example, a 256-bit elliptic curve key would be comparable to a 3072-bit RSA key. This is really beneficial since it reduces the amount of data needed to be stored and transmitted when dealing with keys. Both Diffie-Hellman and DSA have elliptic curve variants referred to as ECDH and ECDSA, respectively. The US NIST recommends the use of EC encryption, and the NSA allows its use to protect up to top secret data with 384-bit EC keys. But the NSA has expressed concern about EC encryption being potentially vulnerable to quantum computing attacks, as quantum computing technology continues to evolve and mature. I'm gonna buy Suzanne and Daryl a drink today for all their hard work. In the meantime, we've cooked up an assignment for you that will test your encryption and decryption skills. Take your time to decode all the details, and I'll see you all in the next lesson. Congratulations on finishing this lesson from the Google IT Support Certificate. 
Access the full experience, including job search help, and get the official certificate by clicking the icon or the link in the description. Watch the next lesson in the course by clicking here. And subscribe to our channel for more lessons from upcoming Google Career Certificates.